All right, thank you for coming out, and it's great to have the original nine, seven of the original nine, and it's, uh, it's the first time we've had a group uh, inducted in the Hall of Fame, and uh, so they're, they're, they're used to being first in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, I was inducted with Billy, Gene, and, and Bjorn Borg, and yeah. Dennis Ralston and Alex Omedo, and Dennis and Alex actually passed away this year, so it's, uh, it's a little sad, that was sad news, but... Uh, but it was a real, it was a great class in 1987 when, and uh, Bjorn and Billy Jean and, and, uh, and Alex. So it's great to see the group and, uh, and uh, the impact that you all have made. So um, I think we'll open up to the, to the uh, press right now to ask any questions they'd like. Oh gosh, you're so shy, that's funny. They're passing a mic around. Yeah. Yeah. We got to pass there a mic, are. so there so might be some passing delays. a mic around. The question, we'll know who to give it. <laughs> uh, I'm curious, and I'll open it up to, to really anyone, um, but what your thoughts are in terms of being trailblazers as the original nine, really kicking off and, and starting what is professional, not just tennis for women, but being trailblazers in women's sport, women's professional sports across the, 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 the landscape. I'm curious what your take is in terms of what today's landscape of women's professional sports, other leagues, can look back on your legacy and what you did on that day to influence kind of their decision making um, going towards, you know, establishing leagues like WNBA, NWSL and all that sort of stuff. Well, let me talk first for a moment. I think that Yes, we're trailblazers, but we're also incredibly lucky to be in the right place at the right time to show up, as Billy says, and to stand up. But we're lucky in other ways, too, to have had what I call the Holy Trinity, my mother, the architect, the engineer, who was holding down two full-time jobs plus, and to have had such a star as Billie Jean to be behind us and with us and to have had the money. We were, because we had a Fortune 500 company that was supporting us and that in many ways felt they needed us too, a cigarette company with, for a women's brand and there we were a women's product and there they were getting booted off the TV, where can we put our money? So how to replicate would be very hard to get all of those factors in the same place. The other factor was that as soon as the tour got started after Houston, women became pouring in from all over the world. No, not everybody did. But we had people who were dedicated, willing to work, pushing it through. And I just hope that other sports can get that kind of a combination and a kind of the stars were right for us. I know that I would like Billie Jean to talk on that because she's uh, been involved with the other, you know, women, through the Women's Sports Foundation, et cetera. But yeah, of course, we always want to share our um, uh, success with other women's sports. Uh, I know soccer has been working on the equal uh, play equal pay, and uh, that's taken a while. And you know, and looking at the history of uh, women's sports, uh, certainly the LPGA has been around for a long time. And uh, when I look at their prize money, I cringe because when we look at ours at 3.2 million for uh, a fortnight at Wimbledon and U.S. Open, likewise, and all the Grand Slams, in addition to our uh, WTA championships, um, the money is there. And the money's there because uh, of, uh, obviously, the original nine. And uh, again, uh, history was on our side. But uh, I think we made a lot of things happen. We had a lot of foresight. We had the le leadership of uh, Billie Jean. And I think that's what's lacking in a lot of the uh, women's sports, uh, a lack of leadership, a lack of commitment, uh, uh, and a lack of vision. But um, we, we're hopeful that we can all work together and that you know, the WTA can help them and they can form their own associations or unions because that's very important. You got to have one voice and that's what we had, a very loud one. Well, what we started, uh, 
then jumped into more attention for uh, Title IX. So you start impacting the ground roots level for girls' sports, women's sports. Um, we, it's amazing that because of everything that fell into place, but with Title IX and other sports uh, being available for the girls because of money and because of what we did, um, it's impacted, to answer your question, it's in really impacted where we are today. It's what we started. Yay, us. <laughs> okay, well, uh, Courtney, to answer, um, that's a big question. It could take a while, but the LPGA started in 1950 with 13 members, and when we started, uh, obviously they were the, f the first, um, but we went ahead of them immediately. Uh, I, f I felt like they're, I don't know if they paid enough attention to the business side. We did. Um, and that made a huge difference. You look at the WNBA, women's sports, I'll just tell you, is in its infancy. When and if we ever get the money, the enthusiasm, the investment behind it, then you'll start to see acceleration. There has been some acceleration. One of the things that helped, like Valerie talked about, was Title IX in uh, 1972. The Olympics in 1996 was the, the, the Olympics of women. They could named it. I, I don't think I quite have the name right, but it was Women's Olympics. And why? Because the USA won so many gold medals that they never had, whether it be soccer, softball, basketball, or whatever. And that is that was the result of Title IX. It took that many years for... Uh, us the women and girls to start having the coaching, the opportunities, uh, the travel, all the, all the things that go in, in making an athlete better. Uh, so that's been a hard struggle as well. Um, but things are very slow. They just are. Change is slow. And uh, you have to be persistent. Uh, but women's sports has a long way to go, but uh, it's doing better. But when you only get two or three percent of say sports center uh, or media how are people supposed to know who we are as human beings because that's what people like they like who we are as a human being is what they're interested in not just how we hit a ball they want to know about the person the story that's behind it and if we only get three I don't know Courtney do you know exactly what it is is it three or four of us in there no it's just sports coverage I know I started with Sports Center. That's part, that is that's an example, but I, overall media, I think it's three or four percent. How are we supposed to be known by that way? How how are we supposed to do better? If we're not covered properly, if people don't, because people do get interested interested in us, because we did media, and then they read our story. Now they're interested. It's not the tennis. It's the human element. It's always about the human being, the story, that makes it interesting. So I just intel, and we need everyone to get behind it. I mean, 95% of the media is still, traditional media, is controlled by men. And usually people want to talk about themselves. Okay? It's always about them. So the reason King Riggs match had so many people, because the media, 95% men, even then, now you can you imagine has hardly changed. Now it was important because it was about them. There was a guy involved. That's why we had so many people, because they go, this is about me. Therefore, we got the attention. If it had been against another woman, we would have never gotten that attention. And yet he was 55 years old, and I, we never wanted to compete against the men. We never said we're better. We never said it. Only the men would bring it up. We always said we're about entertainment. And that's what we are as athletes. We're performers. We're entertainers. So it's a long haul. But until we get a shift, and unless human beings support each other equally, it's very, very tough. Um, so we need all the help we can get. We love allies of any kind. We don't care what gender, what, I don't care, color. Just we all, We're all in this together. So uh, the, the, the thing you want to always do is create opportunities for everyone you can because it just makes life better for everyone. Hey, this is for all of you. Um, you guys have seen so much change already, but how much more change and what kind of change do you want to see moving forward, if any? Are you talking about tennis, tennis or tennis. all sports? Just tennis. Who 
up there too. But I couldn't hear you. Could you, say okay, could you repeat the what question? What kind of change, you guys have seen so much change already, but what kind of change do you want to see moving forward for the WTA and the ATP tour, um, if any? You're asking. Um, the WTA has to um, continue how it is, but also improve uh, the situation. We're in a very volatile time in our sport right now. You've got the ATP. You've got the players, what is it, Professional Players Tennis Association with Djokovic's group. Tyriac just uh, has, did he just file a suit against the ATP? It's, we're not in good shape right now as far as the upheaval that's going on behind. But it kind of reminds me of 50 years ago, actually. Uh, and that happens every, in the cycle of anything. There's these times when things are kind of going along and peaceful, and then there's upheaval. Right now, we're in upheaval. We're really, it's, uh, it's very difficult and what we have to do as the WTA and as, for, as women is make sure we're a part of this and not be an afterthought and not be 30 percent of something or you know then some you know controlled by maybe a, a small group or something so we, we I think we need to be very alert we need to be at the table on both uh, the ATP and the other association uh, professional tennis association or whatever and they don't talk about the women at all but then if they're asked, they go, oh, yeah, we have women. That's all they say. That's baloney. You can't talk like that. You've got to, you've, we've all got to be at the table um, for our sport. It's just not about the professional sport. It's also about grassroots. It's about developing countries. It's about getting children to participate. Like FIFA gives 80% to boys for uh, development in soccer and 20% to girls. And where do you think their biggest growth opportunities are, though? It's with us. We are the growth opportunities. We are just, if you want just straight business, forget gender, forget everything. We are the opportunity for growth, women. And every time people ignore it, they're losing out and we're losing out. So as human beings, we want to just help each other, period. Okay, I don't care who the person is. So anyway, that's, but I'd say we have to be very alert right now. I would say, if I'm not in the inside, so, um, if we were like where we were in the old days, in the real inner sanctum, I would be really nervous and I'd be in every meeting, I would just be like truly, truly hyper vigilant right now. Hi, Ken Paltek from the AP. Question for any of you. Um, I understand 50 years ago is a long time. When, when you started to come up with what you wanted to do, was there one of you, if you could look around at each other, that figured that you were the real leader, that there's always that one person that has that fire and gets this going. So who would you credit that to? Okay, this is the easiest question you've done. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Billie Jean was our leader. And um, I thought Ralph had a lot of fire. We that's had fire, that's no, true. That's why we won, because we all were connected. We're, our connection is, is totally unbroken. Even today, I just was thinking about looking at everybody laughing and having a good time our connection has never been broken we are so connected i i just think it was such a um that everyone everyone contributed so much in different ways and but every single one of us it was commitment total commitment and focus gladys was sensational fearless just she, she was hysterical too she's very funny she was eccentric she was different she was i like that though i, I like that in her Plus, we all had to be here in order to be able to play. Yeah, yeah I mean, she had to have somebody to play and beat, <laughs> right? So we had to be around, <laughs> you know? And then every once in a while, we have our upset of the tournament, and we would beat her. <laughs> so <laughs> that was our glory. But um, yeah, no, it took every one of us to get here. You know, the, another thing that I know we talk about enough, part of our bond, or maybe a lot of it, is we were in the trenches together. There wasn't anybody there saying, in, in the tennis world, saying, oh, please do well. <laughs> so there we were fighting every bit of the way. We worked like the modern tennis players would think this is nuts. We were giving a clinic or two a week. We talked to anybody who, who, who could breathe. We <laughs> went to cocktail parties when he showed up in town and our eyes were rolling up in our head and we thought, these are the people who can help us. But we were in the trenches, and we have those memories. 
of what we did, the fun parts, the awful parts, we were in it together. Yeah. I have a, the media, I have a question with media the always wants to talk to the top player. And so this was our top player. Mm -hmm. She stepped into that role mm -hmm. and was amazing. She grew into that position. She's brilliant. She is uh, well-spoken. Well, no. And so, of course, this is our leader. And who can do it better? Why would I talk when she can talk? She's just, <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> anyway, it's just so obvious what a star she is. And more power to her. And she led us. And name another person that's as phenomenal as Billie Jean King. I have a question. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. With, um, with uh, any of you, is it? Uh, do you think that ladies today on the tour appreciate what you all went through? Well, the women do. We don't call them ladies. <laughs> ladies, and, ladies and gentlemen, that's that's Wimbledon. Do I, I don't know that people know enough. I think the International Tennis Hall of Fame is opening a door to history. No, but I'm talking about the women players on the tour right yeah. now, do they appreciate what you've done? Because it's certainly not the case in uh, the men, uh, the, the men no, playing today, they don't understand it. No. But I was thinking that I many of the women, uh, and a lot of the women don't really consider the history of the game being important to them because they've got everything set up pretty well right now. You know, they don't realize, when I ask a, a player today, and I go, how do you want the sport to look five years from now, 10 years from now? Because you're, you're in the thick of it, and current players have the most power because you're seen the most. This is your moment. Like Djokovic getting this players organization right is the right time for him. He's current, he's powerful. And um, they look at me like, huh, what do you mean? Well, I said, well, all right, well, you're a member of the WTA. Well, how would you like that to look five years from now, 10 years from now? What do you do, want, not just what are you gonna do for our sport, but what do you, how, do, how do, can we help make the world a better place? Because um, I think that's part of our job if we're gonna be professional athletes. And we have a unique. I don't think they think that way. Well, we have a we have a unique opportunity. Very few people have a platform like we do, and so how are we going to use those moments to make this world a better place? That's what I think, and I think we thought about that because we talked about the future generations. Our whole focus was on the future. Everything we did was for the future generations, and I said we talked about it. I said if you expect applause, don't do this. And that's why it's okay, because we, we knew they're not, probably not gonna, uh, the future generations probably aren't going to care. The, what happens in any new situation, any new league or anything, I, I tell the soccer players, it's from the 90s when 99, I don't know if you remember the World Cup and all that, in, at the Rose Bowl and all that. So anyway, I tell Julie Foudy or Mia Hamm or those players, we talk, we laugh. I said, Julie, because she was the heart and soul of the team, she was kind of the captain leader, I go, Julie, the first generation and the second generation use the word we, and they're very connected. Like we were very connected to Chris Everett and Martina Navratilova. We gave them a lot of mentoring, a ton. I cannot tell you how much time we, get, we spent with them. And they were the very f next generation after us. They're very appreciative. But by the third generation, you'll start hearing the word I. And so Julie and I had, I told Julie back in the old days, and I go, well, how is it? She goes, you're right, by the third generation, I started hearing the word I, but it was we the first two generations. And I'm sure the men have had the same experience. So it's like, this is reality. Do you want to do it or not? If you want it for applause, I, I remember telling all of us in the bedroom at your mother's house, don't do it if you expect applause or a lot of money. We're not, we're not gonna be that group. We're the starters, but we are not gonna be the big shots. We're just not. And. Um, now you see the players today and they don't know. Yeah, but don't you think it's important to mention the other side of those that did not join our group, such as Chrissy Everett, who was considered too young and didn't want to risk her career. No, that's not her fault. It's her dad. She's still apologizing to me. Right, but she's a... No, I keep saying, Chris, stop it. Your dad made those decisions. All right, Billie Jean, we're going to have a fight now. Yeah, go ahead. Let's go. This is what we used to do. Go ahead. This is why we learned. She was, she was a person. She... She was good for, at a young age. She could speak for herself. She was great. <laughs> what, about, what about Virginia Wade or oh, some now, of the now others we're talking, that would That's a whole other discussion. What about Margaret Court? Very good discussion person. Uh, 
I, I guess my yeah. point is Margaret is liked it. Margaret liked it when we got a lot of money. That we paved the up. money way for some other people that jumped in a bit later and reaped the benefits and did not do any work. I think that's just no, as we were, important. We as were not happy about that. No, but what do we know? That. No, no, but no, what we, we talked about right that. You guys, it, we talked it about out. it. We talked very clearly about someday the other group's going to be with us. And that's when I want, you know, I wanted the WTA. Well, well that's because the USTA failed. Uh, they did, well, they negotiated, tour. yes, the, whatever. The point is, you cannot take things personally if you're going to win. And we talked about this at ad nauseum. I said to the, we said, we talked about the other ones are going to come along soon. Eventually they will. And we're going to welcome them and we're going to move on because it doesn't do any good. It just doesn't. D but Margaret did show up for the money. There's no question. <laughs> we got equal prize money in the 73 U.S. Open. She was definitely well, here. And Stan, the I, I'd like to see the players, and I think WTA, their presence, uh, always at tournaments, servicing the players, giving them everything. But sometimes I think the agents get in the way. The agents are definitely And so the communication with WTA and the player does not exist the way it did with us. I think that is lacking and should not be. Uh, I think it's their association. They should support it. They should do what needs to be done. They should be able to speak directly to the player and not their agent. And they should know what's going on with their own world. Their own, it's so important, and, and they do not. No, the agents have a lot of power now. We don't, yeah, it's, it's okay. most of the players don't really learn about our sport and, and the financial part and how a tournament really works or they don't really, they let their agents do everything and agents control a lot. So, yeah, that's the way it is. I know, maybe, but you know, why do you think all one this happened, you guys? Know because of on. money. <laughs> so, you, know. you know, we tried to get money, so now we got it and this is some of the challenges you're gonna have. I mean, look at, look at, look at the NBA, look at, look at base, look at baseball, the, what they make, oh my. Anyway, I'm going to take us to Zoom for a follow-up question to this that, um, Nicole, you're live. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, question. We know that the gender pay gap affects every industry. What advice do you have to women who are trying to negotiate pay rises, fight for pay equity outside of sports? You know, what, what about your experiences is transferable regardless of uh, what industry you're in? My quick one is get together on this. Seriously, I mean, because the only way you accomplish anything is having one voice. And I think that's very important. Either you, you know, unionize yourself or however, you know, you can get the other uh, women together, uh, be on the same page, uh, talk about the same things. Um, I know Billie Jean can talk further on that because that's what she does. So, so please talk further well, on Well, there's that. been studies, and uh, Wall Street Journal did a really good study um, on women and men getting hired. Women are usually hired on performance and men are hired on potential. So what I ask everyone who's hiring, this isn't what Nicole asked, she's on the other side of it, uh, is that well, please look at the person. I don't care who they are across from you when you're, if you're talking to them or if you're doing it virtually or whatever. I want you to think about their potential, not just what they've done. With women, they always go, oh, what have you done so far? And women tend to shy away from asking for more. Um, Ilana and I, my partner and I have run, you know, we have a business and it's so interesting. A guy will come in and say, I want more responsibility. And that means I want more money and a better title, okay? Women never come in and ask. So please, Nicole, ask for what you want and need. Women are taught not to ask for what we want and need. We're supposed to be so grateful with the crumbs. So instead of being grateful for the crumbs, I want you to think about the cake, the icing, and the cherry on top, top, and you deserve it. So that's important if you're gonna, and try to really find out the marketplace if you can, and don't be afraid to ask for more than what you used to get. A lot of times people will offer a woman a, a salary and she'll go, oh, thank you, it's, that's nice, that's nice, and they won't increase it. A guy will go, no, no, I was thinking, okay, let's say it's 20,000. The guy will say, no, I think it should be 25,000. And that's what you have to, you have to learn to be brave, ask for what you want. Try to really think about your, what makes you who you are, what your value is, where do, where's your strengths. Uh, that's where you need to go. So uh, I don't. What do you think about the original nine? Did we ask for what we wanted? 
Yeah, we did ask for what we wanted. Yeah, I mean, the, so we're saying to others, do it. If yeah, go for well, it. We did, too. Uh, yeah, Nicole, but what's the worst uh, thing that happened? They say listen, no. Listen, I've, I've got a solution for her. Take her. <laughs> I'll help you. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll help you. <laughs> now, we also go into companies and do DE&I, so, um, because we want, we want companies to... My, my be, ten be granddaughters ask what they want all the time, uh, but <laughs> I guess it changes as they get older. It does change. Well, the generations have changed too because our expectations have gone up, which is good. That was what it was all about. I mean, that's why I wanted to make a hundred thousand dollars in 1971. The first time we did a tour, I t I told Larry in December of '70, I was just thinking. I said, "What would get the media and the public's attention?" Everybody understands money, whether you're a school teacher, whether you're a factory worker, whether you're a CEO, everyone understands money. That's a, a measurement that everyone can relate to. So that's the common denominator. So I go to myself, I go, Larry, I know this is ridiculous, but I'm going to try to make 100000 in 71. He goes, whoa, okay. I said, I don't know if it'll work. So I talked to Gladys, and I said, Gladys, how many tournaments do we have? How much prize money? Because how are you going to get to 100000 And the winners are making 2300 uh, most of the time, but Gladys put on a tournament in Houston for forty thousand dollars in August, and to the winner went ten thousand. Well, that's worth three or four tournaments, right? So I'm going to myself. I have to win the Houston tournaments at uh, Hoffines Pavilion. I don't know if you guys remember that, and I knew that was going to be the turning point if I could make it by October. And but I knew if I could make a hundred thousand dollars, that the media would follow us. The public might start getting interested in our stories and all of us. So I said, I am going to kill myself next year. And if, I, if we can make 100, we have something to talk about. And our first year is our Virginia Slim series. We can do this. So um, I did make 100. In our, the last tournament, I went over 100. But the important thing is the President of the United States called me on it. People were excited. And it was, a, it was about number five of all the male and female athletes in 1971. If you look it up, Johnny Bench was making $80,000. I think Willie Mays made 150. I made 117. That's also got us people paying attention. So that was why the first year was so important out of the, out of the blocks to make the sponsors happy because we have a lot of local sponsors. Every tournament has local sponsors. So you've got to make everybody happy. And you want to make your fans excited. If they see that, they get excited. So those are those are some of the things behind the scenes that were happening to make to make this this interest come. And then all of us killing ourselves, every single one of us, every day and night. We signed every autograph when people were leaving the stadiums. Every single person got an autograph. We did not leave. And then usually someone was waiting for us backstage, like a magazine or somebody to write a long article about us. So we did not stop. And that would finish at 2 a.m. We'd get up and make a 6 o'clock radio program. Now, the players today would say, you're crazy. Well, because of our craziness, you have Osaka made $55 million. So we are still, what we did as a group is so relevant today not only, I mean, you think about what these women make. Osaka made $55 million. Why did she make that? You can relate right back to what we did. It's, it's relevant. History is relevant today. So I think it's very, we're very relevant today, not just in 1970. And so when every, any woman in tennis gets a check, okay, you can go back to the day we, were, we signed the $1 contract with Gladys Hellman. So I sit there every time somebody gets a check, I go, yes. They're living our dream. They are living our dream. Now their job, what are they going to do for the next generations? That's their job. Tennis makes uh, you have a backbone. The game makes you very independent. And so I'm not afraid to ask for a raise because I have a backbone. I'm an independent woman. And it's because of this game. That, it's the game. And so um, if any advice that we can give to the future women out there that are afraid, uh, go play tennis. <laughs> well, we, we are the leaders, but yeah. I don't think the other uh, women's sports know we're the leaders, though. But I think they're very unaware of us. You guys can make a difference yeah. there. An independent are sport the really helps. And so they need to become stronger. Maybe their why isn't strong enough. Why are you asking for more money or are you afraid? Well, if it's the reason it's my children, I'm gonna ask. 
I'm going to yeah, ask mommy, because my yeah. why is there. So if you're afraid to ask for more, uh, you have to ask yourself, what's going on? Why are you afraid? What is the reason that you want more? And if that reason isn't strong enough, you're not going to walk in the door and ask for more. Right? Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know. It's a question. We can have a great discussion yeah. later. Yeah, well, <laughs> anyway. I'm a, a real estate agent, and I get paid the same as the male agent, so I'm yes. not in that battle. Uh, but when I get back with these uh, women, and I see, because I start talking, because I don't know the game where we are, and I start asking questions. Um, you know, it's very interesting to me where the game is, and it's, uh, it goes right back into my, my passion. I love tennis. But uh, I'm not in the trenches fighting for women's rights anymore. But once I'm with these women, I go back, and I'm a little more bold with, you know, being aware. Valerie? Can I ask you just a comment and someone who was there from the beginning of this and then your daughter going on to play on the tour, what that experience was like for you? Um, I'm very proud that my daughter, that I raised a tennis professional. Um, I gave her opportunity. I gave her information, knowledge. Um, so from my experience, it really helped Allison. When she was 12, she was up against... Um, uh, a really good player, Venus Williams. She's the same age as Venus. And Venus beat her in the 12 and under 6061. And I went, oh my gosh, I had no idea the level and at an early age of Venus. And, but Allison is good. And so we, it was a bond. It was so much fun to raise a tennis professional. Um, and she loves tennis, and so does my son. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's a part of my uh, journey that I'm very proud of. And, and she's darn good. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Two last questions. Go ahead. Forbes. Mm, Matt Rybaltowski from Forbes. Rosie had some real pithy comments before about un unionization. But with uh, COVID, tournament purses are down 30 to 40%. And it's always been difficult for players in the 100 to 500 range to make a viable salary. So because of that, how, how much do you favor a so-called revenue sharing system that could recoup the, the amount of expenses and, and other costs that the players are facing so they can be able to persist on the tours in both the WTA and the ATP. How many people do you think we should should be able to make a living playing tennis? That's my first question. Sure, I I think maybe the top thousand should be a in thousand? that 100K range or so. Not enough money. Have you talked to the tournament owners? <laughs> but tournament owners only need about eight players, really. That's where all the revenue comes in. In tournaments in the old days, and I don't know how it is now, um, 80% of our, because we own tournaments, we own teams, 80% of our revenues came in on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So in a way, um, you could say we're offering. I think the challenge is, is that that's why I always wanted team sports in tennis as well as the singles. I wanted both. Uh, I've always been interested in that because I grew up in team sports. And my brother played 12 years of professional baseball, so Randy Moffitt. So I've been around pro sports my whole life, and that's another reason I wanted pro tennis. But we used to do this in the WTA, to your point. How many people can we truly support to make enough for one year to make a, live, a proper living? Then you've got to ask yourself, what does that mean? Does that mean for myself? Or do you mean when I have my team of people which cost more money? Every time you see Djokovic, every time you see these people, you know, you see Barty, you see all the top players, and they go, oh, thank you, my team. And I'm going, it is great they can afford a team. It costs a lot of money to, to pay them a salary, transportation, hotel, that's a lot. So the reason I wanted team tennis to make it is because we could provide more jobs. I did the multiples on it, we, a lot of us did, and we probably could have taken care of seven, 800 players, plus you can play all over the world. With, when you think just individual though, like tennis does, you are lucky, I think, I've asked the ATP, is it 150, is that about right? To make, it, to make enough for a year. 150, yeah, it's, it's not a lot. No, it gets close about, to that. It's close to 150 to 200. So that's same with the women. We're 
kind of in that range. We still don't make as much money as the men overall. We do have equal prize money at the majors, which I think the message is just as important as the, as the money. Message is really important uh, that we have equality. You never know who's going to, some woman someplace in a village in Africa might realize that and she'll go, whoa, you know, might change her whole life. But, or a guy's life. You never know how everyone's going to be influenced. But it is really hard when you have, a, uh, in singles, in tennis, the economics, and you're F Forbes, you know better than anybody, to make it work. And you need to, if you talk to the tournament owners and you talk to the players, most players do not even know anything about a tournament. They know nothing about the business, and yet they want to ask for more. More of what? You guys, you got to know both sides of everything when you go in to negotiate, and that's why we did well. Yeah. Because it really helped me to own tournaments because it changed everything. Gladys had done tournaments, she understood. Mm -hmm. That's why we can have a proper discussion. And when we went in to ask for more, we knew the business side of it and understood their challenges. Because when you go to sit with somebody, you can't just be about yourself. Yeah. You gotta be about them. A and we spoke directly to the promoters. We, we talked I directly. Mean, we spoke right. directly. I don't think a player, if they would want more money, would go directly to a promoter. And we've always experienced that. We have to, yeah. Players on the bottom always wanted more money. And Players I on the top are the ones that bring in the money. Yeah. So you can only share it so much, and there's always going to be those left out. And the game is, you know, it's, it, it, well, it, it's tennis. It's not NFL where you have hordes and hordes of... Also, um, they have contracts. We're independent yeah. contractors. That's a big difference. Yeah. But we also, everybody at the same time has to be thinking about the future. Right. So to be able, who can you support now? But if you don't dig down, you won't have a future. So there's a balancing yeah. act. And I think what we're hearing from everybody is how important the money sources are. Yeah. They're the people coming in the gate. They're the companies that sponsor. Yeah. And that's where we did so well in the beginning. We had the money from a Fortune 500 sponsor, but that wasn't going to work unless we brought people in the yeah, gate. We had to bring them in. Yeah. Plus, it, it, it's just a... They have, they have different uh, revenue sources now. You've got media. That's where media content is where the real money is. I mean, the NFL, 100 billion. Tennis is probably the fourth most watched sport in the world, and we have about 1.3% of that. We need to concentrate on that. We need to wake up, but there's a lot of turmoil right now, and I'm sure that's because of it. But just, you gotta understand the business before you go in. I mean, it's like, um, you got to know both sides. When you negotiate with somebody, you, you have to have compassion and empathy for what they're trying to do. Because both parties, when you get up from the table, have to feel like you won something. You give, you take. That's what negotiation is about. It's just not about you, your side. It's about both sides or all sides or whatever is at the table. It's not easy, but the knowledge is important. And that's where I want the players to at least have some knowledge. And I don't think they do. Maybe but some of them. Their agents do, and that's, I don't, that, that's the problem. No, I want the agents. player, not the yeah, agent. I agree with you. And then they always listen to the agent and don't explore. If an agent tells me something, I go ask questions to somebody else, not just my agent, to find out what they think, to make sure is he, he or she or whoever is my agent is telling me the straight skinny. you know, Or maybe they don't know either and they think they know. I don't know. I just think it's important to explore and ask a lot of questions. but. It's tough. There's a lot of money in the game. The more money there's in the game, the more tumult, usually. Is there a last question? I think we've got it. Thank you very, Thank very you, everyone. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, girls. We will uh, be live on Tennis Channel with the induction at 6 p.m. And, of course, right out here on the court. So much more to look forward to. Thank you all.